Uh, thank you for coming for our second talk of our innovation series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Amanda Salmon. Uh, she's, uh, as you can see, an assistant professor in residence in the Department of Surgery here at UC San Francisco and is a trauma surgeon. And we're very pleased to have her. She, in fact, ran over here from the OR <laughs> and barely made it. So thank you, Dr. Salmon. Uh, Dr. Salmon uh, has a lot of experience in innovation, uh, and I'm really excited to hear this talk. Uh, one of the things that she did, I think, in between her uh, fellowship at Oregon Health Sciences University mm -hmm. uh, was a two-year stint at IDEO. At IDEO. Uh, and for those of you who know, IDEO is a world-renowned innovation firm, and so we're very pleased uh, to have her. Please welcome Dr. Salmon. So I'm going to apologize because I have a little bit of a cold, um, and I'm still sort of out of breath from running from the OR. So, um, so George and Toff asked me to come and speak about uh, design and the role that it can play in innovation in healthcare. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about healthcare, but mostly with a focus of design. And I'll take you through sort of one example of how we've applied design, and through a few other short examples um, to try to show you the breadth of how design can be used. So um, as, as Dr. Sue said, I am a trauma surgeon at San Francisco General. So I do trauma surgery, emergency general surgery, general surgery, and surgical critical care. Uh, and I run a research lab called the Better Lab. Um, and the Better Lab, the purpose of the Better Lab was to bring human-centered design, so design methodologies, in-house into, into a healthcare setting, and then to study the process um, rigorously using public health methodologies. Now, if you know anything about design, how many of you know IDEO or have heard of human-centered design? All right, so, some, so a lot of design, human-centered design, gets done in sort of a consulting way. Um, and so consultants do it in the outside and they hand you a pretty deck and then, um, and then you take it back to your entity and you try to apply it. Um, and I spent two years at IIDEO, it was two of the best professional years of my life, learning this methodology um, and really wanted to bring it into healthcare because I wanted to see what happens when you actually took those ideas and tried to implement them. Um, as you can imagine, in healthcare it's really challenging. And then I felt like, well, this is a really good methodology to get to better. To, to understand what it is you're supposed to implement, to get to the P and the PDSA cycle. And, and so this information should be shared. And when it happens in a consulting format, or if it's not published, no one really knows about it. And so the purpose was twofold, one, to show that design and human center can be done, that design can be done in a healthcare context. And the other was to study it and publish on it with rigor. So um, we have a team of, I think we're up to like eight or nine people now. Um, half of us have some sort of medical background. Uh, I have a couple of medical students and residents. Um, and the other half are purely designers. And I have a few unicorns who are both healthcare pro people and designers. Um, and so uh, we spend a lot of time uh, either seeking out our own projects or working with other teams in, to try to bring a design lens to, to a healthcare challenge. So what exactly is human-centered design? Some of you are familiar with it. Um, this is a, a great quote um, by one of the founding fathers, is human-centered design is a philosophy. It's not a precise set of methods, but one that assumes that innovation should be start by getting close to users and observing their activities. And that's the real core of human-centered design in that the purpose of human-centered design is to really understand users and understand their unmet needs, and maybe even understand their unmet needs better than they could articulate them. So. Um, Human-centered design provides a very rigorous structure um, and a framework in order to sort of think about how to tackle any challenge. And it's great for those sort of very messy, hairy, wicked challenges like we have in healthcare, for which there is no clear right answer. There is no empiric evidence. Um, it prioritizes people. So unlike other um, methodologies, maybe something like lean that looks at the system or efficiency, this really prioritizes trying to understand humans' innate behaviors, their unmet needs, their fears, their passions, and to design for that, to help to design an environment to make those humans successful. Um, it's very expansive, which can be very uncomfortable in healthcare to think very big and then have to rein it back in. Um, and it is built on this sense of iterative prototyping. And we do see this in healthcare, um, in lean, in PDSA cycles of, you know, in, in design they'll say fail early and fail often. We don't say that in healthcare because if you fail in healthcare, um, that's human lives. Um, but it is, to, it is to low risk, try something early, and then to, and then to study the outcomes. Um, 
So it can really build anything, and these are some really great examples. Um, the first is a, a community market in Oakland, and that was a solution um, to try to address uh, preterm birth and poor maternal fetal outcomes of un from underserved communities. The solution they found was a market. The other one is a, a de medical device. This is a novel breast pump. It actually won um, one of the best, it won best in tech at CES, which is the big tech conference, and this small little breast pump that was put in the corner. And the last is um, from a colleague of mine at UT Austin, um, Clay Johnston, who used to be here at CTSI, is now the dean of the medical school uh, at UT Austin. And they used design to redesign an entire entire building of outpatient clinics, and this entire building has no waiting rooms. So you check yourself, I know, right? You check yourself in to your exam room. So this is, we, um, you know, if you Google human-centered design or design thinking, there's a number of different methodologies. Um, you know, IDEO is probably the, um, the gold standard of human-centered design. Um, the founders of IDEO then went on to found the D School uh, at Stanford, which is a multidis multidisciplinary school that teaches students um, design and design methodologies. Uh, and, you know, founded by the same people, one uses three steps, one uses five steps, so this is the process we use. Um, and we break it down into sort of three core steps, which are very similar to uh, IDEO, which is inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Those are the ones in the middle. If we were doing pure design, this would probably be fine. But because we're trying to study this, and we're trying to do it in an academic context, we, we we've have, um, created barriers in the front and the back, one of which is preparation, which is all those painful things you have to do, like um, uh, do getting your IRB and all your research set up, and at the end is the evaluation of actually going back and studying, did whatever we end up with actually work? And we think of this, um, when we think about design, um, design in and of itself, uh, in human-centered design, as you're implementing and iterating, you're learning as you go. Um, and so we have a red bar on the bottom, which is data collection. And so we try to be very rigorous about these learnings and to do them in, in an academic way so that we can publish on them so that we can share these learnings um, with other people. So the overview of the design process. Um, so uh, any of you do qualitative research? Some of you, um, and you use Excel spreadsheets, I'm sure. So um, design, one of the things I learned from design, which has changed my life, is the post-it note. So, um, and uh, <laughs> I was underappreciated. I didn't actually appreciate how expensive they were, um, but I also didn't appreciate how useful they were. Um, and so we, uh, the design process um, often uses post-it notes to download key themes. And so we go about interviews, and our interviews are very unstructured. Um, we don't use, we don't really use interview guides. Um, they're very unstructured. And then we download on post-it notes and we put them on a wall. And then as we aggregate interviews, it allows us to sort of live, if you will, in our Excel spreadsheet and start bringing some of these themes together. So that's the next step, which is synthesis. So we start taking all these interviews and start saying, you know, I heard this from this person and, and then we heard it from this person and we're, we're starting to hear in qualitative research would be thematic convergence. Um, and then we start identifying, well, here's an insight. And an insight, um, and I will show some examples uh, in the, in, uh, the example I'm going to give you in a minute, um, an insight is one of those things, one of those aha moments. Something that's either like, hmm, I can't believe that is linked to that, or wow, I can't believe all of those individuals feel this way. That for us is a design opportunity, because it is either a, a surprising finding or an unmet need that you can address. Then we sort of formulate these into brainstorming topics, and if you Google brainstorming, you will see uh, dichotomous opinions on whether it's useful or not. Um, uh, IDEO uses, a, in the D school, use a very rigorous form of brainstorming, um, and so I find it to be very useful. Um, and then we prototype, and we have, I have a rule, it's 110 and 100, which is any one idea can't, um, can't cost more than 10 hours of time over the course of a month, and can't cost more than $100. So these things have to be, they have to be low fidelity, they have to be quick and easy, and they can't be precious. Because what happens in healthcare is we invest a lot of time in these ideas, and then when you go to implement them, it's like your baby, and no one wants to tell your baby's ugly, right? And so you end up with something that just sort of doesn't work. And at the end of the day, whatever your first design is, is probably not going to work. You know, the, cl the, clock's, the clock is right twice. If you have a broken clock, it's right, it's right twice a day. Or, yes, that's correct. So, and that's, and that's the context with design, right? You may get lucky, but for the most part, what you really thought was going to be a great idea probably is going to need to be iterated on. 
Um, so we iterate and then eventually we implement and study. So this is my, one of my favorite quotes, um, and it's sort of attributed to Henry Ford, although I don't think he actually said this, and he said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So if I had asked you 10 years ago what you hated about public transportation or what you hated about taxis, you could have told me a long list, but you probably couldn't have told me you needed Uber or Lyft. You could have said, I don't like not knowing when they're going to come. I don't like standing on a street at shift change in New York City in the rain. I want to use this thing that comes out of my pocket and also can make phone calls. And I want to be able to see where this thing, where this car is. I want to know how many are around me. I want to know that I, I want to be able to, to, to refine down to the absolute minute of when I need this car. So you could have told me the things that you wanted, but you probably couldn't have said I need Uber or Lyft. You couldn't have described it or articulated it. And that's where design is really useful, is to try to understand those unmet needs, those frustrations, those challenges, and to design that thing, to take you from the horse to the Model T Ford, to take you from taxis at shift change in New York City to Uber. So why does human-centeredness matter? Um, and uh, I think in healthcare, a lot of the time we talk about being human-centered, but we're really not. Because the pressures don't really come from the humans. They come from regulation, and they come from throughput, and they come from the system, and they don't really come from the human. So why does human-centeredness matter? So if you think about innovation, innovation requires three things. It needs to be desirable by humans, right? It needs to be financially viable. You have to be able to pay for it. And it has to be technically feasible, right? So how many of you can think about something where we spent a lot of money on and it just didn't work? What do you have an example? Right? EHRs in some cases, right? So what about things that had really swish technology and just no one really wanted them? Like 90% of the apps on your phone, right? Right? Oh, amazing. They're going to make me so organized and like a narwhal flies across my to-do list. Um, but if you don't want it, if people don't want it, if it doesn't meet an unmet need, it doesn't matter how much money you have and it doesn't matter how swish your technology is, no one's going to adopt it. And so the key is to really start with humans. The other thing, and I sort of spoke about this earlier, is this sense of the 110-100. So fail early, fail often. In healthcare, try early, iterate often. So don't wait until you have that beautiful package thing that you're going to try to shove down everyone's throat that's really not going to work. So um, we spend a lot of time when we're trying to implement something telling people this is just a prototype. If you like it, that's wonderful. If you hate it, even better. Because we can learn from what you don't like. So I'm going to talk about a couple examples. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time on one uh, that we're working on right now. And I have some prototypes here. Um, the room is not really conducive to prototypes, but I'll leave them in front. Um, that uh, we were working with um, a pulmonary critical care doctor here who has um, a ton of NIH funding to try to uh, improve adherence to tuberculosis medications in Uganda. Um, and human-centered design is essential for this, one, because I'm not Ugandan, I don't have TB, and I can't even begin to understand the challenges they face in being adherent with their medications. Um, so I'd like to start with that example, because it really, I, we learned a lot of things and we made a lot of mistakes early on, and I think it shows you the power of human-centered design. And then I'll tell you about a couple, um, I'll spend a little less time about a couple um, designs we're working on that are near and dear to my heart um, and around trauma care. So a little bit about TB in Uganda. Um, so it's the leading infectious cause of death uh, worldwide. In Uganda, um, the World Health Organization has set a goal of um, successful adherence rates to medication of 90%. And in Uganda, it's about 60 to 75%. 60% um, of people are co-infected with HIV. And there's an estimated burden of about 83,000 cases in the country. Um, the gold standard, so tuberculosis is curable, and it requires six months of medications. The only challenge is you have to take them every single day. And so the gold standard is what we call dot therapy or directly observed therapy. So you sh traditionally, you show up to clinic every day, and the, the you know, medical officer or the nurse hands you the medications. You take it, they confirm you took it, and you leave. Um, that's great, right? That is, you directly observe therapy, you can guarantee they took their medications. Does that seem like it is feasible for people living in Uganda? No, it's not. So, um, so Aditya Katamachi and a number of other people are trying to think about innovative ways that they can try to do and document the adherence, sort of do directly observed therapy um, in novel ways. So, um, 
some of the ways they thought about are community-based. So there's a person in your community, a village, um, a village health worker, maybe a colleague or a friend, who partners with you and says, okay, I'm going to be there to take your, I'm going to confirm that you take your meds every day. In some cases, this works really well. In some cases, it's an epic fail. Um, and then there's some novel things coming on around technology. And so um, we were tasked with the challenge of trying to apply technology to Uganda. And I'll tell you a little bit about this technology. So this is 99 Dots. So it's, um, it's based out of India, and it's been used in India and Myanmar. And it is a pill pack. And um, I have a couple here that I'm happy to pass around. So um, it's a pill pack that uh, you slip the pills in, blister packs, and when you pop it open, um, there's a number there. So you have sort of a full number, and then if you see up here, a full number, and then empty numbers. And when, when you get to the pill, depending on how many pills you take, that has a phone, you type in that full number, including the number at the phone. And so that then documents that you've taken your medication. You get a beep, you hang up. Now this seems like a great idea, right? But not everyone in Uganda has telephones. And not everyone in Uganda wants to take their medications. So um, our challenge was to take this project, which is to use this technology, and figure out how to make it work for the Ugandan community. So how might we design 99 Dots to deliver meaningful value to TB patients in Uganda? And that was where we started. So um, we have structured this in our three phases of inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Um, I took out the evaluation component. It will be lengthy. Um, and we are about, we're moving from green to blue. So um, we have just finished our last rev of what this design will look like. And I'll take you along our journey. So phase one was basically inspiration. So trying to understand what makes Ugandan ticks, what makes Ugandans tick, um, what the challenges are around tuberculosis adherence, and how we might address them. So to start, so we were going to go to Uganda. Um, and we didn't want to go in unprepared. So uh, there's an entire ground team there of researchers who um, are well versed in um, TB adherence in Uganda. And so we interviewed three of them. And the purpose of this was sort of to understand what makes Ugandans tick. What are their cultures? What are their values? What are their interests? What do they like? They like soccer. They like a musician slash politician called Bobby Vine. Um, they love their family. They're religious. Um, they are, they, some speak English, and some speak other dialects. Um, we then went through a literature search. Uh, we then did some cultural research. So we listened to some popular music. We watched some TV. We read some news. Um, and then we came in, and this is a tool that I think is incredibly powerful, which we don't use in academics, but we use in design, which is sacrificial prototypes. Some call them provotypes. But basically, we came in with some solutions. They were not the solutions. The purpose was to give people something to give feedback on, right? A provocation. Because if you can tell them, if you, if you ask them what are your challenges, they'll give you something superficial. But the provocation allows them to give you feedback, to tell you what they don't like. And then you start getting a little bit deeper. You get beyond what they just say and what they do, to, but what, how they really feel. So I'll take you through the first sacrificial prototypes. So I'm going to admit that I was completely out to lunch when we started this. I came from the context of being an American living in America, um, and with all the luxuries that that affords me, despite knowing better. And so we had said, you know, how might we make this um, improve the experience of taking medications for Ugandans? But we also are sort of a sub-challenge is, how might we make this the best part of their day? which I think is an amazing goal. It was completely framed wrong, and I'll tell you why. But I was really excited about that. So here's why we started. Um, so we said, OK, things we knew about Ugandans is that they're really nationalistic. They're proud of their country. And so we started playing with imagery on the pill pack of the Ugandan flag. We also heard that TB is incredibly stigmatized and that people sort of hide their pill packs or don't want individuals to know. So we played with sort of carrying cases, even things that might be worn on a garter. So you could take it to work and no one would know that it was discreet. And then we played with how do we help people motivate through their treatment? So tuberculosis treatment is six months long. People feel horrible when they're diagnosed with TB. They're weak, they're frail, and they feel miserable. So the initiation phase is the first two months. They feel terrible. 
By the time they get to the end of their two months, they start to feel better, but they still have four months left. And so how do we get them through that four months? I actually think the ultimate design is to make them feel terrible for the six months, and then they feel better on month six. But that's, um, <laughs> but that's unethical. But that would actually be a solution, would it not? Right? Because <laughs> everyone finishes the first two months, if they believe they have TB. So when we started playing with color gradients, how can we move them, pull them through? And does it change from like in the beginning it's red and then you get to yellow and then eventually your goal is to get to green? And do these colors mean the same things to them in Uganda? So this is how we started. So we went into Uganda and we had these prototypes um, in addition to probably 20 more. We had inserts with um, football, sports players, we had little um, religious cards. Um, and then we had, okay, so we could design the pill pack and then we designed what that experience was when you actually typed in the number. Because right now, you just type in the number, you hear a beep and you hang up. But that's a golden opportunity. That's a teachable moment. That's an opportunity to entertain. Right? And I was thinking, hey, how do we make this the best part of their day? So, I'm gonna embarrass myself right now. We did some, uh, does it complete a knock-knock joke? Right? Um, these obviously would have been translated in the local dialect. Um, you know, um, a, a, a quote of inspiration. Um, do you get enrolled in a lottery? Do you, in a, do you get assigned to a team and you tr as a team compete to see who can be more adherent? We had all these brilliant ideas. We had them, and I can pass them around, we had them on like cut out cardboard cards of phones so that people could physically feel them. Almost every single one of these bombed. Bobby Wine, football, how might I entertain you, completely bombed. It was shocking, it was amazing, it was perfect. Right, because we realized we were completely out to lunch. So we went to Uganda, and this is how we learned this. We had two teams of two people. So one person sort of primarily interviews, and the other person takes notes. And we went to Jinja and Kampala. And it, this, was, this was a whirlwind. So we did four days of interviewing. Um, we, would go, we went to a different clinic each day. So we, had, we went to eight different clinics. Um, they would put us in a room and we would interview for like 10 hours straight, hour each. I mean, it was exhausting, but we, we got to cover a lot of people. And we went, uh, the goal was 360 degrees. So in Uganda, there's the usual sort of provider or the TB focal, who's the person who runs the TB clinic. And then there's the nursing officers and there's the clinic staff, and of course there's the patients. And then there's all these community health workers. So there's VHT, CHWs, all these people who are sort of there to liaise with the community. And if they hear from the, the, the local clinic that you know Johnny's not showing up, they will go out and actually hunt him down and bring him in. Um, we spoke to family members. We went and visited them in their homes. Um, we spoke to bacteriologists, and we spoke to, spoke to government workers. We really tried to get 360 of what is the experience of having to be, what is the experience of caring for people with to be in Uganda. So um, unlike most, so if you, th if, you know, I was going working with an implementation scientist, and so when we were putting together his semi-structured interview guide and our completely unstructured interview guide, which is, a little bit structured. Um, you know, his first questions were, do you understand what the rules and regulations are around TB adherence? And, you know, some of those questions. And, and we, we started with, what's your average day like? Right? Because that's, that's going to tell you a lot about how they take their medications. What's your average day like? What do you like? What do you look forward to in your day? What do you dread during your day? Do you have a phone? Oh, you do. How do you use it? Can you show me? Do you take medications? What do you take medications for? What does that disease mean to you? So we really tried to understand and we learned some pretty amazing things. We then spoke with the clinic staff um, and our purpose there, I mean, TB is sort of a stigmatized disease there and you'll hear a little bit about that in the next few slides. So it's, it's a labor of love to work with TB patients. So, you know, we started with, well, why do you do the job that you do? What's your average day like? What do you like about your job? What is the worst part about your job? What makes your job easier? And interestingly, we saw thematic convergence across all of these individuals with these sort of coming at these people from different angles. So these are the insights that blew our mind. So 
In public health, education is almost never the answer, right? Education was the 90s, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, any question? Like, it's almost never the answer. It's almost not that people don't know they need to take their medications or understand the disease, but in Uganda, people really did not understand tuberculosis. They didn't understand how they got it. They didn't understand how it was spread. They didn't understand that it does not inherently mean that you have HIV. The other thing which we were fascinated by is that the health workers are incredibly trusted individuals. Not only are they trusted, but they're, it, people desire, patients desire their feedback. They desire their accolades. Um, and that was surprising to me. That's, I, I, I didn't, I think in the literature you might find some of that, but that, I didn't assume that to be true. The other thing is that the gamification and the entertainment was an, was an insulting luxury. And when you are just trying to survive, gamify me, knock knock jokes almost trivializes the struggle. So shame on me, but it was a great to learn early on. The other is that celebrities, Bobby Vine, politicians, nationalism in the sense of your public health minister wants you to take your medications does not work. They're not motivators. But modeling does. People, and what we found is people, patients were motivated by other patients at the clinic. When they showed up with a new diagnosis of TB and they saw someone else walking out who looked healthy, who said, you know, take your medications, they are motivated by that. But if that person were to be on an advertisement, was not physically in front of them, or was to send you a message on your phone, it felt fake. They assumed they were paid. Very, very distinct. Modeling only worked in person. The other thing is if you look at the pill packs, every pixel of ink matters. Everything on that pill pack <laughs> mattered. Every word, every color. If it was too busy, it was overwhelming. If you said take it with food, they would take it with food. So guess what? If they don't have food, they don't take their medications. Can you imagine? So this is how we learned this. We asked this gentleman who's come back, he's had a relapse of his TB. And we heard this a couple of times. And we said, so why do you think this happened? He's, oh, I don't know. I took all my medications. We said, well, how do you take your medications? Well, I take them at night and I take them with food. And are there ever times that you might not take them? Well, sometimes I don't have food. Sometimes the only food I have, I give to my children. How often does that happen? About three times a week. So when you don't have food, you don't take your medications. No. So you're not taking your medications three times a week. I mean, does that not break your heart? Because you know what? On the pack, it says, take with food. And they're following the instructions. Some other insights, language things. When we translate and when we speak them in English, they don't call them medications. They call them tablets. Um, the TB is a physical disease. People describe TB as being weak, and when they're better, they feel strong. And so when they're strong, they're better, which is about at month two. But we've got to get them to month six. <clears throat> the other thing is that TB is not just stigmatized as an infectious disease. It's associated with certain death, HIV, and witchcraft. And we heard stories where women divorced their husbands because they were diagnosed with TB, and they were convinced that they also had HIV and that everyone was lying to them because TV and HIV always happen together. The other thing we learned is that this pill pack is great, right? People who have phones are gonna, they're gonna, they might text in, but what about the people who don't have phones? And what about the people who get lost to follow up? Because what happens is when people feel better, they're in survival mode. So if they feel better and stronger and wanna work, they go back to work. Why? Because they need to put food on the table for their children. And if they happen to work in a job that is transient, they're policemen, they're taxi drivers, they drive trucks, they're sex workers, they disappear. So they can't be followed. So this pill pack was not gonna change the fact that the unreachable are still gonna be unreachable. And lastly, that this 99 dots is not in Garrett's guarantee. It's not gonna guarantee they take their medications, right? They could open the pack, play the game, toss the pills out because it makes them feel crummy, it turns their pee orange or it makes their skin itch or whatever it is, right? And, and call in the number. And that's true. It's not a guarantee. But we saw it as an opportunity to connect every single day through the pack and through the phone call. It is an opportunity, it's a teachable moment, it's an opportunity to connect every day that you didn't have before. 
So where do we go? So phase two, um, we're just float closing phase two, is brainstorming. So we filled the entire TB Reach um, office building in Kampala, Uganda with Post-it notes. We downloaded, it was exhausting, we downloaded 30-something interviews <coughs> with a local team and with our team. And then we started identifying some of these insights, some of which I've shared with you. And then we started brainstorming. So things around how might we make, how might we make the pill pack educational? How might we make the experience an educational moment, a teachable moment? How might we make pill packs customizable so they feel personal? <laughs> We went through a number of these, and we got, came up with some other prototypes. Some of these are derivations on the earlier ones, and some of them completely new. The first is a derivation, a cheaper version, but also more effective, of this cute little carrying case, the garter carrying case, the hide-it carrying case. Is it, <coughs> if you saw the pill packs, they're just one sheet, and it says something like TB on it. So what if you just put a cover on it? That, give, that gives it a little bit of anonymity, it also makes it so that you have some more real estate, an opportunity to connect with them. So then for the front cover options, what were we gonna do? We couldn't very well say TB medication. We played with something of daily vitamins, strength medications. People did not like that. They felt like it was a lie. It was a lie. We played with nationalism. Right? We, we took a derivation of the Ugandan colors, made it sort of a traditional Ugandan textile, uh, Lake Victoria, which people re really were proud of and liked. But even better, a map of Uganda. Why is that better? It filled two purposes. The first was that it was Uganda. It had some, some pride. But it also could be used as an opportunity for people to customize. Oh, Joe, oh, you work as a, a bus driver? Well, here is your clinic, and here are other clinics along your route. As a reminder system, as a way to orient them, as a reminder that there are other clinics out there if they need to seek care. The other thing we said is, you know, this pill pack functions basically as a calendar. When they get to the end of their pill pack, if they're taking them every day, it's at the end of a month. If they're not, who knows? Then they know they have to go back to the clinic. <clears throat> so what if we just honored the fact that this functions as a calendar and made the front a calendar? They could put personal information in there. They could put the reminders on when they needed to go back and give a sputum sample or when they needed to refill their pills. Then we said, well, so that's the front of the pack. So what about the inside? So one side is just gonna have the numbers. And we realized with the real estate, it's got to be simple. So it's just going to have these numbers, and we did some redesign of this. But when you open the inside, what's that going to do? And what we realized is what they really needed was education. So we played with a couple of versions. So, and these are in English. But the first one is just TB is an infectious disease. Make sure to protect your family and others by covering your cough and coming to clinic. And that was a big public health thing, is if you have children under five in the house, bring them in. If you have, see other people coughing, bring them in. They might also be infected with TV. And then make sure to take your tablets daily. And then there were two lines, and this is in the left upper corner, so that the focal, the TB local person could customize it. Joe, you're going to be great. You can do this. If you need me, call me. So they can make it feel personal to honor the fact that people really respect and wanted accolades and wanted connection with their, with their local health workers. <coughs> the other, and this is the most elegant and I loved but was not possible, which is the far top left, which is, hello, my name is Sally and I am your local health worker. Very personal. So we had this whole system where we were going to take photographs of them and print out stickers. Um, and it turns out there were like hundreds and hundreds of, of TB health workers from so that was not going to be possible. But I'm still hopeful. I'm holding out. Down here was to say, you know what, let's take this out of the realm of like medication and let's just tell them what these tablets do. <clears throat> that they help you fight your medication. They help you fight TB and you need to give your body the drugs it needs to be cured. To sort of make it, demedicalize it, make it a little cartoon. And so that was idea number three. And the fourth was something we heard multiple times, which I was surprised by, which is a before and after photo. So the before, the 
after photo, if you're in the initiation phase, you've recently diagnosed and you've lost a lot of weight, seeing someone who went from skinny and emaciated to robust and healthy and strong, which is important to them, was motivating. If you are now the strong person, remembering what you looked like when you had TB as a reminder that you needed to make it through the complete treatment was, was sort of a motivator, a little bit of a fear factor. So this is where we started. <clears throat> the other one was to take all the stuff. If you look at these, it says, take your pills and take with meds and take with food and all these numbers down here. So we said, let's take all the instructions off the real estate. Let's just make it very simple. And let's put them down here and let's put iconography because people don't all speak the same language and some of them are illiterate. So the first was take this many number of tablets. And then we said, you know, what they're told is take them in the morning or take them in the night. And so if they, something happens in the morning, if they don't have food, they won't take them at night because they follow the rules. So we said, let's play with some sort of icon that helps orient them. And they can choose either morning or night. <coughs> and then let's show them what taking their tablets means, right? We're not going to write it. We're going to illustrate it. So put the pill in your mouth. And then the third is, let's the food thing. You don't have food, you don't take your meds. That's horrible. Now, you might get sick if you don't have food, so we'd prefer you take it with food. But we put, take it with water. So there's water, and then the local plantain is sort of the most common food there. So water or plantain. So you know that it's okay to take it with one or the other. And then lastly, which is we kept hearing is, well, people are going to be worried that if they make this call, that it's going to cost them money. So the last one is make the call, and it shows zero basically zero dollars. It's not going to cost you anything. So that was round two. So um, <coughs> we're heading into the implementation phase. Um, in Uganda, the way these studies are run, it's being disseminated across 18 clinics. And what they do is they bring all the clinics together as, as sort of a randomization ceremony. So it brings everyone together so they don't feel like those who are getting enrolled first um, and those who are getting rolled last, the people who are getting rolled last don't feel like they've been left out or they were second choice. It gets done randomly in front of their eyes. And so they understand and they all feel part of it. And it's fun and you pull balls out of a bag. <coughs> so we use this as a golden opportunity. And our purpose, our goals were to design two things, to design the pill pack and then to design the experience of what happens when you make that phone call. So we held focus groups with <coughs> members of each of the clinics. And then we went back out to the clinics, and we tested these prototypes, and we tested the language of what happens when you make the call. And we iterated again. And so I'm going to show you what the final version is. And as you'll see with this illustration, um, we're enrolling in tranches. So we're going to enroll uh, three clinics a month. So we'll have a tranche January through April, and then March through July, and then August through November. So we are going to have three opportunities to iterate in context. So we're, we're going to implement what we have now, and then we're going to go back and get feedback and iterate again, with the purpose that by the time we get to the end of this, we have been through six, seven, eight iterations, and we will have gotten to something that's better, that works better, that improves adherence, hopefully. So <coughs> what's the final version? So, the, so this is the final version, and this is not in English, so I apologize. So what we realized is the, f the focals and the people who work in the clinic like the idea of being the expert and being able to customize, and customizing to the individual. So when you open the inside flap, which is what you see here on the left, it says, hello, TB is an infectious disease, or no, it says, hello, I am your local health person. And this is where I had to sacrifice the personal photo, which I'm still <laughs> devastated about. Um, we put in the name, and then this is the number you call. People loved that. If I have a problem, this is my person. This is who I call. This is what they were looking for. On the right is the opportunity to put a picture, a sticker. And we have a couple versions of what that sticker might be. And it's going to be customized between the patient and the provider or clinic staff. And then down below, we iterated again on the illustrations. And it seems silly to be like playing with iconography and illustrations, but these things really mattered. So it says down there, take this many pills. And then we, have, we had to separate day and night because people got confused when it was in one box. <laughs> so you circle one, but this also created an opportunity for the health worker to engage with the patient. So when would you take it? OK, we're going to circle the day. But if you can't take it in the day, it's important you take it at any time so you can also take it at night. So it gave an opportunity for them to engage, make the, make the patient feel like they were getting something personal, and make the health worker feel like they were the expert. Then we show them you take your medication. And then we, you know what? The food thing, they just kept saying, just take it off. 
because it, it will be a barrier. People will be confused. So we're saying take it with water. And when they're, if they're savvy, they will, and if we, we will tell them, if you can't take it with food, take it with food. But the instructions say take it with water. So there'll be no confusion. And then lastly is, the, again, the icon for to call in the number. It's not going to cost you any money. And then we played with the color gradations, because this requires that you actually follow some sort of pattern. And what the Ugandans do is what they tell us is they take the pill wherever their finger lands. It's a direct quote. So they might take one here, one here, one here. There's a very good chance they could take pills in a day that didn't have a phone. And so the way that the Indian um, pills were structured is to go right, like you read. But that's not how they take pills in Uganda. They go down. So then we played with, well, let's go through the colors and let's take them down. Let's make it very clear. Let's have arrow, arrows that take them back so that they, it follows what their natural process would be and prevents them from sort of taking whatever pill wherever their finger landed. We took everything else off of the pill pack. There is no take with food, there is no instructions, it's just the number you call. <laughs> and these are the stickers that allow you to customize. The first was um, the before and after. Now, when you, if you notice before, it was a circle, which made it feel like a cycle, which made it feel like you could fall back into it. That didn't work. So then we changed the arrow, so it was very clear, if you take your pills, you get stronger, and if you don't take your pills, you get weaker. And the other one, and this seems so simple, the other most important thing was to teach people how to cough. And we'd had language from our first iteration illustrating it, but, or describing it, but we needed to illustrate it. So cough into your elbow, don't cough into your hand, don't cough into space, don't cough into the face of your five-year-old child. So these are the two options that they're gonna start with. There's the customization on the left of this is your focal health worker, and this is the number you're gonna call. And then on the right is either this is how you cough appropriately, or this is what happens if you take your pills, or this is what happens if you doesn't, don't take your pills. It actually works both for people in the initiation phase and for people who are trying to continue in the continuation phase. <laughs> and lastly, the front cover. So we landed on the map in the calendar. And we're giving also stickers people options. And one of the things we're looking forward to learning is which they choose and why. Does the map option get chosen more for people who might be more transient? Does the calendar option get chosen for people who want to customize it? Do the nurses or the clinic staff influence what gets chosen? We're hoping the patient chooses, but it'll be really interesting to see how this unfolds. So that's the pill pack. It, we have been through seven, eight iterations of this over months. Silly things, changing iconography, changing words, but it really has gotten to us to something that's much better. And I think, I'm hoping, will make an impact. And the last bit is, so when they call in, what are they gonna hear? So before it was gonna be a knock-knock joke or something ridiculous that was just demonstrated that we didn't really quite understand our population. So what we heard is people wanted to People wanted to be thanked for taking their medications. They wanted to make a connection. They wanted to, for those who are early diagnosis in the activation phase, they wanted to know that they could be cured. It's not witchcraft. It doesn't mean you have HIV, although 60% do. It doesn't mean you're gonna die. If you take your medications, you will be cured. It, it also has a lot of messages around protect your friends and family. Cough appropriately, bring in children under the age of five. If you see someone else coughing, bring them in. And for those in the continuation phase, the messaging's a little bit different. We're still thanking them, gratitude, and reminding them by taking your medication every day, you'll be, you can be cured at the end of six months. You may not feel sick, but you still have TB. It needs to be treated for six months. <coughs> so I have about 10 or 15 minutes. That's an example of, um, I really wanted to go into detail because I thought it was important to really show the iteration and how, you know, there's a very good chance if design wasn't involved that a pill pack like this would have gone to Uganda. And it might have worked. But I think we uncovered so many opportunities and so many opportunities to treat these as educational opportunities, teachable moments, adherence tools, to help pay, make people's lives a little bit easier, to make them feel more cared about. And so I'm um, looking forward to seeing what comes out of this. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about trauma care. And then I'll take questions. And this is gonna be pretty quick. So um, I'm a trauma surgeon. I work at San Francisco General. Um, we're the only level one trauma center in the, Bay, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco Bay Area. So anywhere from halfway across the Golden Gate Bridge to 92. We, have, we are a well-oiled machine. 
we would have a really hard time improving on our outcomes. But we can certainly improve on experience. Um, trauma in and of itself is a little bit like a snowflake. No trauma is ever the same. Seriously, it is an ad hoc group of people, depending on who's on shift, residents, attendings, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, um, radiology technicians, and then throw in the patient. This patient's dying from a head injury. This patient's been shot. This is a kid who's fallen out of a window. It's never the same. And so you bring an ad hoc group together in unknown circumstances and then expect them to perform and make decisions in seconds. If you imagine doing that in your professional life, it's sort of bananas. And so we came in and saying, you know, we can't really improve upon outcomes. I mean, I'm sure you can always improve upon outcomes, but you have really good outcomes. But we want to improve upon the experience. And so we said, we're just going to take, whereas Uganda was, we have a technology that we're going to sort of take a design lens to. It was a very constrained challenge. We came in and saying, we're going to just try to understand what's going on in the trauma bay, how our trauma care is administered, and see what we think we might be able to do to make the experience better. So we did 35 in-depth interviews. These are sort of hour-long, unstructured, semi-structured interviews. We did 50 hours of live observations in the trauma bay. And then we also videotape our traumas um, for quality improvement, and they last for about 14 days. So we observed some of our most um, acute traumas, about 15 of them. And we identified two things. One is PPE, which is personal protective equipment, the masks, the gowns, the gloves, um, that it needed a re redesign and that our adherence rates were deplorable. The second was is that people, because it is ad hoc, people didn't really understand each other. Like, people didn't know each other, which is fine, because that's how it's going to be, but they didn't understand each other. And we identified an opportunity to, to add technology to try to solve this. Um, and so I'll talk through these two examples pretty quickly. Oh, yeah, and I have, I actually have, it's, the technology is VR, virtual reality, so I have a VR headset for anyone who wants to play with it after, after the talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so PPE. So we did the 50 hours of unstructured observations of 900, which is our highest level trauma. So those are lights and whistles, someone's acutely, gravely injured, and everyone reports. Um, we did uh, structured observations of the 900s, which is the, the video. We did the in-depth interviews. And then we did usability testing, because what we realized is about 25% of the people in the trauma bay actually had appropriate personal protective equipment on, and the other 75% did not. And if you think about any context in healthcare, short of an infectious disease like TB, Trauma care, is pr you are probably the most likely to get contaminated. And so why is that? Is it that they don't understand? I told you before, it's almost never education. And I can tell you in this case, it was not education. So we tested, <coughs> we usability tested the PPE. So we asked people, we said, please put on the PPE, please put on the personal protective equipment as if this were 900 trauma. And I... Um, I don't have a photo here, but the way our PPE is stored is it comes in, you know those, um, the carts that like you'd see in an auto shop and you pull them out and they almost have a, when you pull them out you get a little of a click. So they come and like one level has the masks and one level has gloves and some other booties and the other one has the, the gowns. And so, um, so we said, okay, we have a compliance rate percentage of 25%. And what we've heard from our interviews is that it's really painful to put on PPE. It's time consuming and in a time compressed environment, people sacrifice themselves to keep their patients alive. And so here's what we found. It takes 83 seconds to don PPE appropriately in our trauma bay. That's 83 seconds. We make decisions about whether we're gonna open someone's chest if they've had CPR for five minutes. Are you gonna allocate a minute and a half of that to put your PPE on? Probably not. Um, the other thing is if you, if you wanna put on shoe covers, it's an additional 30 seconds. So you're up to two minutes just to get your appropriate stuff on. There are 19 steps to donning PPE. And that includes both physical steps of putting stuff on and decisions you have to make. Pull out the cart, decide which one I want. Okay, I want that one. Shut the cart, pull the next door. Okay, I want this one. I'm gonna put this on, but I gotta put this one on first. So I'm gonna put this one under my arm because that was, it just doesn't make any sense. And so what we realized is the personal protect equipment we're wearing and using was never designed for trauma care. It was not designed to be rapidly used put on by an individual. We are using personal protective equipment that is either for infection control, which sits outside of a patient's room who may have TB, and you have the luxury of time of putting it on, or it was designed to be donned for you in the operating room. No one's designed rapid use personal protective equipment. 
So the storage is inconvenient. It's fragmented. You have to literally open a package to pull out a package to open a package to put on a gown. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, there's overwhelming choices. Like if you have to stop and think, do I want this one or that one, you've wasted seconds. Um, there's no clear protocol. So if you ask people what they put on first, they don't tell you. People aren't even sure what the appropriate PPE is. Does it have to have a hat on? Does it include booties? I'm actually still not sure. I can't find it in the literature. There's multiple steps, and it's unavailable to many. So when you go up to the cart, one person can use it. Do you know how many people we have in our traumas that are high level? 20. So 83 seconds times 20 people, pushing people out of the way to try to get to it. If you're more important, I mean, it's a little bit, it, it's a little bit of chaos. And one of the problems is in our trauma bay, we sometimes have short ring downs. So the trauma pager goes off, and when you get there, the patient's there. Or we get a walk-up shooting or stabbing. The patient's already there, and you have to get there. And so it's inefficient. The, storaging is, the storage is challenging, and it oftentimes does not adequately cover you. The PPE stands in the way in patient care. So if you ask providers, they will tell you, yes, I want to wear PPE. But when I get to the trauma bay, I'm going to walk in the room and assess the patient, figure out how they're dying, and I'm going to stand there until I either need it for a procedure, and that's when we see people put it on, or the patient's stabilized in some format, and then they go put it on. People are putting on PPE to protect the patient, not to protect themselves, because they've already decided that the patient's life is more important than their own protection. It is exactly what you want in your doctor. Right? You want them to like run into a burning building for you. But I think we could probably design this to make this better. So we actually had a brainstorm today, but we've been working on this for the last couple months. So we've played with things from on the, on the left side is <coughs> taking a cue from the firehouse. So how do they get into gear quickly? They line it up. So let's not make a bottleneck at the annoying pulley, you know, pulley drawers. Line it up against the wall. You can grab your PPE as you're walking into the trauma bay. Or what if it was all in one? What if you like skis, you like clicked into it and you just pulled it up? Another thing we've played is, what if it's a belt? And you always have it on you, and you roll it up, roll it down, and you're ready to go. And you just reinsert cartridges. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. And that's one of the things we're currently working on right now. So to round this out, um, the last is virtual reality. So I know nothing. I knew nothing about virtual reality. I had no interest. I'm not like someone who is trying to bring technology to healthcare. Um, I have a hard enough time just working the technology I have in healthcare already. So adding additional technology um, was not the goal. But we found an opportunity, and I think this is the best way to add technology, is to find an unmet need and then to realize that there's technology to meet that need. And that um, is virtual reality. And so it all started from realizing that traumas are snowflakes. There's no way you're going to know everyone in the room. You're not going to know everybody. You're not going to be. Sometimes you know the. You, sometimes you know the other attending or the other resident, but that's not the way this works. Sometimes you know the nurse's name, but that's not the way it works. So the goal is not to know the person. The goal is to know their role and to understand who they are, and to understand how the room works. And one of the trainees said, "You know, I I spent my entire training." learning how to do the ABCs, which is the care of a trauma patient, airway, breathing, circulation, but no one taught me how to run a room. You want to know why? Because they've always trained from the perspective of themselves. I train as a trauma surgeon. I have never stood in the shoes of an anesthesiologist. I've never stood in the shoes or, or actually been in the role of an emergency medicine doctor. I've never been in the role of a respiratory therapist or a nurse or a charting nurse. So I don't actually, I am an individual athlete trying to play a team sport. It would be like having a quarterback who knew where he wanted to pass the ball, but not having a clear plan of where the running back was supposed to go, right? Totally broken. So there's an opportunity for us to cross train. We sort of learn, you, you sort of intuit into what people's roles are, but no one actually teaches you to cross train. In, this, in the land of snowflakes and ad hoc teams, we need to know each other. So um, 360 video. So. Um, to simulate a trauma, there's virtual reality has multiple sort of formats. There's um, virtual reality in its purest form is computer generated. But a computer generated trauma does not have the fidelity you're looking for, right? You can't, you can't simulate trauma. You can't simulate someone coming in with a bullet in the chest and actively dying in the stress in the room. You need it to be authentic which is where 360 video comes in. So you can mount 360 degree cameras and actually allow people to put on virtual reality goggles and be in that space. It also allows you to perspective take, because you can cross train. If you have 360 cameras set up in different spaces in the room, you can stand in those different spaces and play that different role. 
it's authentic. It's, it, it gives you the gross, um, sort of feel of what it is like, and it allows you to take reps. And when you're dealing with snowflakes, you can't redo something. So you do a trauma and you say, you know, I think I could have caught that hypotension earlier, or I think I could have done this better. You don't get a redo. And oftentimes you don't get a debrief because we move on to the next trauma. And so this gives you an opportunity to take reps and take reps from different perspectives and take as many reps as you want so you can get, a, so you can get better. Football teams are using this. Quarterbacks are using this. Kickers are using this. They're using this in, at Walmart to help customer service people respond to customers better. And it just makes sense that we'd be using this as well. So <laughs> we set up cameras in the trauma bay, and I'll just take you uh, to our trauma bay. So we did this in, in recess two, and um, we filmed about 15 sim real sort of high fidelity simulations with moulage, so making actors look like they've been injured. And then we filmed for four evenings and then for, tw for 24 hours straight over a week and filled every trauma that rolled in the door. And it, as you could imagine, the logistics and the consent and the legal was astronomical. But um, we had to consent every single person who came into the room. So that's 20 providers and staff plus techs and paramedics and patients and family. Um, and so we have about a library of 25 videos. So this is what it looked like. Um, this is for, we gaff taped it. So we taped it all up white so it didn't seem so um, sort of intrusive, but we had a tripod above, sort of above the head. So from the, from the perspective of the anesthesiologist standing at the head or the person who intubates standing at the head of the patient, the person perspective of the left side of the patient, which is usually the trauma junior provider, either a trauma surgeon or emergency medicine resident, <clears throat> from the right side of the, the patient, which is usually either a nurse or a respiratory therapist, from the foot of the bed, which is sort of the senior attending role, and then from the door, which is where the charting nurse stands, because she can never see or hear, and yet she's expected to document. So, um, so we're currently in the process of uh, editing all the videos and creating a curriculum, and the goal will be that, um, that we will be uh, taking residents in multidisciplinary teams, so anesthesia, emergency medicine, and trauma surgery through these different positions, and they will watch an unaugmented video, and they will sort of document what they think the perspectives and goals were of, the, of that provider. And then they will experience the same video with graphic overlays and audio cues around three or four key teaching points from the perspective of that provider. And you might think, well, how different could that be? incredibly different. So, um, and I'll give you one example. So when I look at the chest of a trauma patient um, and I see EKG leads there, I'm a trauma surgeon. Uh, an anesthesiologist might look at the chest and look at the EKG leads and say, you know, I, I wonder if they're in the right place to reflect the rhythm. When I look at the EKG leads, I think, I wonder if they're in the way of my knife. <laughs> I kid you not. It is a constant thing. They're putting the EKG leads in the, in the optimal position and we're moving out of the way of our knife. You know, It's like a trauma provider looking at a face and an anesthesia provider looking at the face. They're looking at completely different things. And we intuit our way and sort of f f discover our way into that, but no one really trains us. And virtual reality allows a really interesting opportunity to do that. Some other things that we're interested in, once we can sort of help people perspective take, I think it allows us also to improve performance. And um, there's technology coming out every year, and uh, some of it is eye tracking. So at Trauma Bay, you learn ABCs, airway breathing circulation. So airway's intact, they're, they're, they're making words, they have breath sounds, they have a pulse, and then you move on. But no one teaches you, going back to that quote, how to run the room. So if you look at a junior resident, and if someone comes in with a traumatic amputation, everyone's eyes goes to the traumatic amputation. If you're a senior trauma provider, you look at the traumatic amputation, you figure out if it's still bleeding, and then you move on. You spend most of your time, I spend most of my time looking at the monitor, watching the nurses, looking at the IV poles to see if blood's hanging, and watching the room. I spend less time looking at the patient. I don't know what the best practice is, but I think we can determine that with eye tracking, with gaze tracking. We can see how senior trauma providers work a room, and then we can train residents and people to perform like that, like you train a quarterback to catch a read a couple seconds earlier. 
And the last thing about virtual reality is, um, you know, for us, again, it's we're fighting on the margins. I mean, we do trauma care all the time. But unfortunately, mass shootings aren't just happening in cities anymore. They're happening in places that don't have the exposure, don't have the access. Places where they feel unprepared end up with acute stress disorder, PTSD after the fact. So something like virtual reality, particularly with the cost of these, this is $200. Now, it democratizes experience and exposure. You can deploy these. Each level two, level three, small town hospital can have one of these where people can take reps. They can see what trauma care looks like, feels like. So that if it ever happens, God forbid, in their hospital, that they are prepared. And we're working on um, putting together a proposal now for the military. One of the big challenges is attrition of knowledge, skills, and abilities during peacetime. So all of a sudden, you take a guy who's doing you know, appendectomies on healthy 20-something-year-olds at you know, a military base, and you deploy them to the forward lines in a war zone. They're not taking the appendix out of young men. They're dealing with mangled individuals, mass casualties, and they, don't, they didn't have the opportunity to train. So you can actually use this to maintain skills. You can train and, again, take reps. So um, I have this here, Devika, who is one of my designers in the back and is an, an amazing, amazing, motivating force behind a lot of this, can sort of set this up. If you guys, some people want to ask questions and some want to put the, the headset on to just take a feel. We have a three minute video and it's, it's a simulation, obviously, because we can't share a real patient, um, we can't share a real patient um, scenarios, but um, it gives you an opportunity to see what it's like in virtual reality to be in a trauma bay from multiple different perspectives. Um, and lastly, uh, this is the perspective of the patient. So very few of us actually sit in the patient's shoes to see what it's like. And so one of the things we can do besides perspective taking is empathy and allow people to, um, to providers to experience what it's like to be a patient in the hope that we can provide a little bit more humanistic care for our trauma patients. So I think we have about 20 minutes for questions. Dev, I'm going to, if anyone, Dev, I'll just give this to you. And then we have some of the prototypes. Um, if you physically want to look at the prototypes of the pill packs, I'll just put them up here. And then I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. <coughs> Oh yeah, so that, that was actually one of my early ideas, is to pay them. Yeah, so the, pay, the question was, what happens in Uganda if you just paid people to come and take their medications? Um, and, I, and then I said that was one of my early ideas. Why don't we just pay them? And that was, people had vehement, vehement dislike for that. Surprising, one of them was, this is their personal responsibility. They need to, they need to, they need to be, make it a priority. This is their health. The second is, <coughs> what happens when you leave? Nice research program, and you leave with your money. Then what? That's not a sustainable solution. Um, the things we did here is paying or compensating for transportation was the one way that payment seemed just. But otherwise, yes, I, I mean, I said, what if we just paid them? I mean, I play with paying our patients to come to clinic at San Francisco General um, or come to their operative appointment, it's cheaper. Um, but yeah, it was really, it was met with a lot of cultural um, disdain, which I, which I was surprised by. But it makes sense. When research money leaves, then what? They're no better. It's not a sustainable solution. Yes? So it sounds like you, and I just <coughs> your intro, I'm sorry. Yeah. It sounds like you personally went to Uganda, you yourself. I personally went to Uganda. Yes, it sounds like I personally went to Uganda. Yes, I personally went to Uganda. So how did a nice trauma surgeon like you wind up getting to this design work? How, what, what, what took you out of your, your comfort zone? Yeah. Did yeah. something so different from what you were trained to do? Yeah. Um, so um, the question is, uh, as a trauma surgeon, what, um, what got me from going leaving trauma care, which is something I know a lot about, into tuberculosis in Uganda? If I told you um, I was also working on redesigning perinatal care for vulnerable patients in San Francisco and designing early family care and um, mobile app for victims of violence and 
a couple other things. I'll tell you that um, we're a design shop. I mean, I, and I see our expertise as doing design work in healthcare and that we say we are challenge agnostic, but design focused. And I think um, it's really fun to design things for my own department and my own discipline, um, but it's even more fun to design things for other uh for other disciplines, because it gives almost as a designer, it gives you a license. I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, I go to these meetings and I say, I don't, I, I don't, I don't care one way or the other. I want to design the right thing. I have no agenda here. I'm not in the department of OB-GYN. I'm not a patient. I am just an, an unbiased designer who wants to do right by our patients at San Francisco general or, you know, in Uganda. And so, um, we are very focused on, uh, doing projects in our discipline, but always every year having one or two projects outside of our discipline. And also, um, we're building sort of a knowledge base of institution insights um, and truths and design principles of working for with vulnerable patients, working with San Francisco general vulnerable patients. And then you can layer on substance abusing or victims of violence or pregnant. And <clears throat> so with each experience, we sort of build upon what we already know. Um, and and it, it broadens us, but it also helps us come with a, a broader perspective, if you will. Yes. You know, in uh, fashion shows and Broadway plays, they yeah. have these people backstage that are called dressers mm -hmm. that dress up people that are in between the scenes. Have you ever thought about having just hiring people to, to be like dressers for your PPE? Yes. Um, so the question is, in Broadway shows and um, runways, runway modeling, um, fashion shows, they have dressers. <laughs> and that's ostensibly what we have in the operating room. Um, and we did think about that. And it is a, it's a possibility. But sometimes we have three traumas at the same time. Um, sometimes we have a mass casualty. And so we, we, we're thinking, when we think about sustainability, it's, it, it is a great idea. Um, one of the things I started, we started one of our ideas was dresser, and then we moved to, well, what if it was like the iron dresser? Like we call the, we call the retractor the iron intern, because interns used to be the ones who held the retractor. So what if it was the iron dresser? So it was stayed outside each room, and you walked into it, and it refilled. Or it had a cartridges, and you walked into it, and it was, because you really just need to sort of, dive in, if you will. So yes, I think there is, that from a storage perspective, um, certainly having it displayed in that way, having it set up as if someone was going to dress you is a way better design. Yes? Could you talk about how funding works in UCSF? So say you engage in another discipline, and you come mm -hmm. up with some prototype, you go through kind of validation, and then there is enough that is a yeah, let's pilot this with sort of real patients. Is there, a, is there an approach in the UCSF where you take it to some form of steering committee? Or how do you get work funded to move forward? So the question is, how, um, how, do you, how does the funding work at UCSF innovation. for innovation? Um, and how do you get funding to move things forward? Um, I don't know. That's, <laughs> um, Funding is challenging. Um, and the traditional funding is traditional researchers get NIH government grants or foundational grants. Um, and so some of, and, and then now there's opportunities within UCSF and UCSF Health or San Francisco General to do quality improvement grants. So everything in, everything gets funded from a research perspective, from my perspective, through some sort of grant. <laughs> now I have funds um, from my department to sort of start this entity um, that will run out in the future. Um, so that's, I have that, but then we also have grants. So like we were written into this NIH grant in Uganda. Um, we have internal quality improvement grants. Most of this is grant funded. Um, and uh, you know, we, uh, if you were to hire a real design shop, um, we charge pennies on the dollar. <laughs> we gotta stop doing that, but we definitely charge pennies on the dollar. Um, when it comes to implementing, so I guess the question is, let's say I designed the iron, the iron um, uh, PPE sort of device, and I could patent that. And let's say I did that with the Surgical Innovations Lab. So there's two labs. So the way UCSF works in terms of owning your IP is that 30% goes to the investigator, 15% uh, goes back to the investigator's lab of any royalties, and then everything else goes to UCSF. 
because <laughs> it was designed on site. So if it is my lab and another lab, it would be between us to sort of d decide who, how we allocate those funds. Um, so, you know, we're working on a project with the Surgical Innovations Lab, and um, we're less focused on devices and patentable things, although that may change in the future. And, you know, they said, we'll just split it 50-50, and, like, the PI in, in the lab will decide how it goes among his people, and you'll decide how it goes among your people. And so, um, but really, and that's the challenge with design, because I frankly think everything we do in healthcare should have a design component. We should at least be pausing and saying, mm, are we implementing the right thing? Is this the right study? Am I writing the grant, a grant just because I have a null hypothesis, just because I can have a, I have an assumption. I really think everything, the design is what you do before you write the grant. Like you, you need to know what you're implementing is the right thing. Don't just grab something and, and, and implement it. And so, um, but there is no real true traditional funding for that. I think human centered design is getting more popular, but I, that is a, that is a, a, a real challenge. So how do you get that work funded? Cause it's labor intensive. I mean, 50 hours of interviews, you know, a team of four deployed to Uganda, we probably did collectively did, <clears throat> I don't know, 10 hours of interviews in two teams. That's 20 over four days. You know, I mean, that's 80 hours of work. Um, it's very time intensive. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, the Biden uh, cancer moonshot, one of the things they did is they opened up the clinical trials that go so that developers could create apps. Yeah. And it's hardly happening at all, and it's still, you know, I'm sure there have. I'll be honest, when I was at IDEO, I think they did something around clinical trials, designing clinical trials, but that is getting people enrolled in clinical trials is a perfect design challenge. It is messy and it is complex and there's a profound inequity of who gets enrolled and who doesn't and who has access and who doesn't. And Googling on the internet is overwhelming for a provider not to mention a patient. So yeah, that is a perfect design challenge. I'd love to tackle that. Let's put that on the list. <laughs> so following up on the financing question, it seems to me a lot of this, <clears throat> if you're doing something better, it's gonna make it cheaper. And so uh, is, isn't there some kind of, a, should there be some kind of a financial incentive for the insurers and so forth to be looking for, and so do they, or is it just too complicated to see the end? Or? I think that's that's one of the that is a solution. Um, I have a colleague at UCSF who sort of does that um, through the um, the CIC, which is the Clinical Innovation Center. He t picks off challenges and does some design work around that for the hospital. Um, and you know, you can decrease length of stay by de decreasing delirium, and then there's sort of you can take whatever the the revenue was from that and get takes a percentage of that um, revenue share, if you will. Um, we, uh, that would be a great model for us. We tend to take on vulnerable populations, vulnerable patients, and so there's not going to be much of a revenue sharing from the Uganda work, or even like developing an app for victims of violence. It's, it's sort of an orphaned process, um, but it is, it, that is a way that some people have, have financed their work, and, um, and that's, you know, some of the things we've done redesigning workflow. We've, you know, improved discharge order times by an hour and got interns out an hour and a half early and, you know, done things that, that have clearly clear financial rewards. Um, and I'm sure we could figure out how to monetize that at some point. Some of our work, maybe. But, yes, some, some people are, are, are doing that. Any other questions? Yes? Well, not a question, but just another <laughs> Messy problem. Uh, at, at ASCO in 2017, they said that just patients reporting their symptoms on a timely basis to the nurse uh, providers improved overall survival by five months. Mm -hmm. It'd be really cool to figure out a way to, to have patients report symptoms in cancer. Because that's a pretty big, that's yeah. one of the most new drugs. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of data around. Um, 
you know, check-ins with patients with chronic disease like, um, you know, COPD. Or there was a woman, a psychiatrist here, who built an app for schizophrenics, and she can actually sort of to try to identify when a um, schizophrenic break was going to happen and intervene early on. And so I think there's definitely social media. I mean, you can actually identify a, schizo a manic episode weeks before based on people's social media, you know, footprint. So I think there is... Um, I mean, given how sort of quantified our, the quantified self and how interconnected we are and we have our smartphones, our smart watches, uh, I think that probably makes a lot of sense. Um, it just would take a designer to do it. Yes. So last week we heard about Health Hub. Yes. Which sounded like it was the kind of thing that was trying to help people who wanted to help. Uh, right place, or people who wanted help. Yeah. In the right place. But I'm, I'm thinking of such a labor intensive. This design work, as you say, is so labor intensive in yeah. terms of the qualitative interviews and things. I mean, are you hooked into Health Hub to find people to help with those that phase of your research? With actual work. Actual qualitative interviews. We are not, and mostly because um, the interviewing. The, the skill of the quality, the interview is, I think that's the most important thing. And so we are pretty, um, we're pretty strict about the criteria of who does our interviews. And we really basically take people who are trained like we were, so D school or IDEO trained. And so, and we have, un, we have fortunately had an endless supply of either <coughs> masters in design students from Stanford who worked for Boeing and now want to get into healthcare or um, Berkeley students who are doing design and public health, or residents or medical students who want to learn the process. So we have a fair number of bodies who help us do that work. Um, that is great. We, uh, there's an endless supply of people who are excited about sort of bringing design to healthcare. Um, and br I mean, this, one of the reasons I, I mean, besides the fact that my family's here and I love the Bay Area and I love, love San Francisco general, but to build a design shop in the Bay Area, the, the design talent here, the quality, the, the quality of the ability of these individuals to, to do the ethnographic interviews is really spectacular. And so we have no shortage of like incredibly talented people. Um, the, but Health Hub, if they had funding, hey, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak and uh, have a great night. Thank you.